So welcome back, everyone, to this episode of, of Transrational Perspectives. I'm Noah Taylor, joined with my co-host, Sean Bryan. And in today's episode, we're continuing our theme of talking with interesting peace people about how they understand the field of peace studies, what it is, what it's not, what it could be, where it's going, and maybe where it should be going. So we're happy to be joined by a longtime peace colleague, Balaz Kovacs, someone who's been leading an interesting life in this larger field of, of peace studies, peace research, and peace work, uh, someone who we thought might have some interesting reflections to bring to this discussion. So thanks for coming on, and uh, as a way of starting, say, how would you introduce yourself and who you are and how you came into this this kind of work? My name is Balaz Kovács, uh, but you've already said that, and uh, uh, I've been in this field in one way or another since 2004, 2005, when I, I did my master's degree in international peace studies. And, uh, and uh, since then, I try to satisfy different interests, let's put it this way. Uh, so I've worked uh, as an academic and I've also worked as a practitioner. Uh, so uh, at the moment, I work as an independent consultant uh, with some NGOs. Um, I had worked at the University for Peace, which I'm sure all your uh, viewers are familiar with, uh, if for no other reason, because uh, we all know each other from there, the three of us. Um, and then I did a PhD in peace studies slash politics and international studies at the university in Australia, the University of New England. So I used to teach uh, uh, peace and conflict studies and international relations for a very brief period uh, in Thailand after my PhD. And uh, the last five years or a little more, I've been working mostly as a practitioner, uh, occasionally teaching this and that. Very originally, I got into peace and conflict studies uh, driven by partly an intellectual interest and partly by an ethical decision so to speak. So ever since I was very young, I was interested in war. Uh, I think war is a is a really interesting, fascinating uh, social activity. Uh, so I, I had this intellectual interest uh, in war, but there is I also had this sort of ethical standpoint where war is also wrong. Uh, so uh, one should not ideally participate in an active manner about uh, in it. So, uh, so somehow that led me to uh, to enter this peace and conflict studies field, where I could intellectually engage with this with this social political phenomenon, uh, but in a way that I find uh, ethically acceptable, uh, meaning trying to overcome war, trying to mitigate the impact of war on people. So that's that's sort of how I got uh, into it uh, originally. So uh, so that's that's sort of me. I grew up in the Cold War uh, on our side of the Iron Curtain. Uh, so uh, I'm from Hungary. Uh, so that that my dad made me watch the news when I started elementary school. So from the age of six, I watched the news every day, uh, and that shaped my my outlook on things, including conflict. Uh, and developed I developed an interest very early on in these uh, in these affairs. So that's kind of how I got into the field at that level in terms of my own motivation. Um, and then just by pure chance. Uh, so I grew up in Hungary in, in the late Cold War, early post Cold War period. So um, this was not really something that was around peace and conflict studies. I heard about it by pure chance uh, from two random girls that I met at a restaurant in Budapest. Uh, like just like totally randomly. And that's how I got into this whole field. And they happened to work at that strange small graduate school in Costa Rica. Um, and uh, and they happened to pass by Budapest. Uh, so that's that's kind of how I, I, I got into it. So that's kind of the short story of how I heard about peace and conflict studies in the first place. I looked it up and I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. So that's that's how I, I, I enter this field. Okay, that's really, really interesting to see your your 
both the, the intersection of your biography and personal motivations and happenstance, which I think is how a lot of us find ourselves into this particular field. Um, yes. I mean, in, in a, a bit later, we'll come back to the, this question of being an academic and a, a practitioner. But um, because this field is so, I guess, diverse and diffuse, it would be interesting to also know, like, when you say that you do peace research or peace practice, like, how do you have a particular definition or understanding of what that means or what it doesn't mean? Okay. Um, I guess somehow it will, maybe it'll come back. When we, when we talk about this sort of duality of being a practitioner and an academic. But if you want to ask my definition of what is peace and conflict studies, let me begin by a negative one. It's not, it's not a discipline. Uh, it doesn't really have its own set methodology. It does have a research interest as such, which is conflict, but it's not unique to this area of research. Anthropology is interested in conflict. Politics is all about a particular kind of conflict waged through particular means. Uh, sociology has a great interest in conflict. Basically, also social sciences are very much interested in conflict. So it's not unique to, to peace and conflict studies. So to me, it's a, I, I think of peace and conflict studies as as an area of research centered around the phenomenon of human conflict, someone could make an argument that human animal conflict uh, is uh, is a legitimate uh, area of peace and conflict studies. I'm not quite sure I would agree with that, but I also wouldn't fight, you know, that. So, you know, I, I think uh, this is this is this is the next thing about peace and conflict studies. I think. Uh, you can do it as a as a multidisciplinary or as an inter or an intra uh, or a uh, uh, nah? okay <laughs> I wanted to say these words so quickly uh, uh, so you can you can you can take different approaches uh, I tend to I tend to make an interdisciplinary uh, uh, approach to this. So I try to draw from different disciplines. My original uh, studies were in law. So my first degree is in law. I studied in continental Europe. So you go straight to law school from high school, not like in the, the Anglo-Saxon system where you do a pre-law and then and then you study law. So to me, it's 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 a it's a research focus on this phenomenon of conflict. And then and then what direction you come into it and in what direction you take it, I think it's quite free. And uh, and I and this is something I really like about peace and conflict studies, that it's sort of this big umbrella under which a lot of us can find uh, a place. A lot of us that might not even see eye to eye on a lot of things, but still somehow we, we share this interest in, in studying conflict uh, and how to end conflict in ways that uh, you know, preserve communities, preserve human dignity, or even, you know, increase uh, human dignity. Um, so that's kind of how I see peace and conflict studies. Um, it's again not unique to peace studies that, that there is this strong connection to uh, practice. And I think very often uh, practice sort of leads peace research. Uh, rather than the other way around, but obviously there is this sort of mutual uh, connection between them. So that's 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 how I see it. It's a diffuse uh, area of research and researchers who who have this shared interest in uh, in conflict uh, and who are willing to step out from their disciplinary boundaries. I think most peace researchers somehow step out from the boundaries of their own disciplines. And I think that's a crucial element. And that's what differentiates a, a political scientist or a sociologist studying specifically conflict from a peace researcher or a peace and conflict researcher that that you 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 abandon the the narrow confines of your of your discipline. That's kind of these are my thoughts about it. As diffuse as I feel it is. Yeah, that's really really fascinating. I just um, that 
like I like that you said that uh, peace and conflict studies is isn't a discipline, but it's a phenomenon. Or like the the the, the 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 phenomenon of peace and peace and conflict are the the center, and that it sounds like to me that the one of the defining characteristics for you of a peace researcher is the um, is stepping beyond the the boundaries of the disciplines that you might have been originally trained in or are functioning in, right? Because you're probably if you're working within a university, you're probably in like an anthropology department, political science department, um, and and it might not be as that there's just a handful that have actual like peace and conflict studies yeah. departments. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yes, absolutely. And 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 I think and sometimes you know the criticism against the discipline also comes exactly because of this character mm -hmm. of or well not discipline, the the, the the research area, peace and conflict study. The research area. That, yeah. that that it isn't that it isn't a discipline that by by moving beyond your disciplinary boundaries. I mean, I think multidisciplinary approaches are more acceptable to some more conservative minded uh, researchers and scholars. Interdisciplinarity is frowned upon. Transdisciplinarity is even more problematic in the <laughs> eyes of a lot of people, I think. Uh, but I think it's really crucial because at the end of the day, uh, human existence, you know, I mean, analytically, it's useful to break things down, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, our existence cannot be compartmentalized uh, as neither so, as an individual nor as a society. Yeah. Of Beautifully put, Balash. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, mean, I, I think actually, I think you're hitting the nail right on the head of like a, 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 an important kind of philosophical and structural problem of say, even the university mm -hmm. of academia is that like, the what the distinction between say chemistry and physics or or you know biology and um, um, you know botany or or something like that like um, and this is a question of like well what what are we putting as like center points of mm -hmm. an area of inquiry mm -hmm. right and we consider something like maybe biology or psychology a discipline because of historical precedent more than anything. And Often, yes. uh, and like so, just the idea of putting peace as the phenomenon of peace out of a very important um, cultural phenomenon at the center, and then kind of building around. Well, these are the things we do. It only becomes, say, murky because um, there are uh, previously established traditions of anthropology and psychology and political science and and, and ethics, and uh, that uh, we're all drawing on. Uh, to try to analyze this um, um, phenomenon, <clears throat> and this is they have the same kind of question in in uh, their new kind of areas of study, whether it be um, you know women's studies mm -hmm. or um, uh, some post-colonial studies or these area studies of like indigenous studies, Asian studies, um, you know, European studies. Like, what is that other than uh, just like an uh, an area of focus? Exactly. And also, like if you take any of these, uh, they also are a hodgepodge of disciplinary approaches. So mm -hmm. I, I actually I never looked into it, to be honest with you, uh, and I probably won't have the time or the energy to do it. But it would be really interesting to dig a little deep, like, um, you know, how, uh, I don't know, like Max Weber, or, and his generation, you know, introduced sociology uh, as a, and as, a, as an established discipline. And did they get scorn from, or you know, like Boas and and the early uh, and the early anthropologists, uh, you know, did they did they did they have to fight all these battles, so to speak, for respectability uh, when when those disciplines emerged uh, as disciplines? Um, it would be interesting to know because maybe they went through the same, uh, you know, process as as peace and conflict studies is going through. I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. A good a good thing to signpost for a future uh, doctoral researcher to to yeah, take. For sure. <laughs> yes. for sure, take a, take a note of that yeah. one. Well, yeah. And I think that these ideas also touch into a bit why we are interested in starting this channel is that I think people like us represent a kind of shift in the peace studies story from the first people who are in this in this field as a as an academic field. They they are like you said, um, they all came from a different discipline. And then it, there started to be some some master's programs. 
and then some PhD programs and then much fewer undergraduate programs. So we all have an academic background in peace and conflict studies, but it hasn't really been so long that you could do that. Mm -hmm. And then it hasn't been so long that you could actually do an entire like academic track. Like now it is technically possible to do an undergrad, a master's and a PhD in peace studies if you were very strategic and yes. could move around the planet. <laughs> That's right, because uh, I, I know that there's one undergrad in England at the University of Bradford. Mm -hmm. I think they have an undergrad. And then I think maybe some in the US, maybe Kennesaw, I think might have. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe yeah, they only so, have a yeah. master's, but they might. But not very many, no. indeed. Masters, yeah, plenty all over the place. If, maybe if even can, more than we need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can include master's degrees in like conflict resolution, oh, yeah. uh, or like then there's a, a, a plethora of yeah. programs out there. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, but yes, it's it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting stage, I guess, in the in the dev in the development or evolution. I don't know what term mm -hmm. I should use here. Uh, of this area and you know maybe our grandchildren uh, will be respectable <laughs> you know uh, peace and conflict studies scholars uh, you know who command the the heights of academia <laughs> if that thing still exists yeah <laughs> but you know so yeah it's possible <laughs> and, uh, and i suppose it's also a problem of the the initial expansion you get with like a transdisciplinary perspective and approach is like all of us from different perspectives can come in with our own weird interests mm -hmm. and have an umbrella. But then, of course, a field can't be everything because mm -hmm. then what, what is it? So like, how do we set what that is? Well, yes. And you know what? Maybe maybe if I, you know, I, I don't actually believe in reincarnation, but let's <laughs> entertain the thought for a second. And, you know, I come back as my own, you know, grandchild, <laughs> great grandchild. Uh, and uh, maybe I wouldn't be attracted to this so much because it's already a very close discipline. Right, right. <laughs> and mm. and, and my, maybe I would be like, ah, no, this is just, you know, uh, too restricting. <laughs> uh, and so maybe I would be mm. I would be searching for something more interesting at mm -hmm. the time. That's a good so, point. yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting reflections on the, uh, the state of the art there. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I think it's, but I think it's really fascinating because uh, I think that is obviously, you know, great divergence in terms of the quality of research that comes out, mm -hmm. partly because of this undefined nature of this, and because because a little bit everything goes, uh, and I'm not trying to pretend that whatever I do is like really outstanding. I'm just saying that 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 is, you know, that and um, so there is a lot of chaff, but there is also a lot of brilliant stuff, mm. I think, that's being done. Um, uh, and I think I think that's that's kind of because of this ferment uh, that really people with very different ideas and pursuits come in and come into contact with each other. And then, you know, bet of ideas, debate, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think one of the points you brought up is something that that I both I really like about the the field and being um, involved in it, and it's also one of the challenges that is that it is that is that it is broad, right? And that I can I can um, I can draw on psychology and um, um, spirituality. And and bring that into my say, academic practice, <clears throat> and I feel like that's something that I that other disciplines would be wouldn't afford me as as easily, and, and yet the, that causes a problem because then like it it's so broad. What really is it? And in in being at this level of a, a PhD or 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 a lecturer, <clears throat> uh, then how can I be an expert in it? Because it, it's so, it's so broad. I mean, I can't know, I can't know everything. And then, um, you know, sometimes someone will ask, well, well, what about this conflict? I'm like, well, like, come on, it's a big, it's a big field out there. You know, I, I, uh, I don't know all the intricacies of, of like Kashmir or something like, like that. Well, I the thing that, you know, one of the, the, <laughs> I think now commonplace observations of both peace and conflict studies research and more recently even practice uh, is that, you know, context is really everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, you know, 
I think in practice, it's a bit, that's, it's one of the things in which practice is a bit behind, I think, compared to research. I think this is, this is one of the observations that at least I saw coming out more strongly from research and earlier that you, you really can't just go into a place as a conflict expert or as a peace expert and then, and then you know, save the world in Kashmir. Uh, you really have to have an understanding of Kashmir or you have to work with other people who have an understanding of Kashmir and then, you know, something, you know, can be done. Um, but, but that's also, you know, uh, what does it mean that you are a conflict expert or an expert on peace and conflict studies when you can't actually say anything meaningful about any specific conflict because you already understand from your learning and expertise mm -hmm. that that you can't so that's that's that indeed is a paradox there i think i remember a very early piece of a uh, career advice someone giving me was you know in this kind of thing what you should do is pick one or two regions to specialize in and one or two themes so you're the gender and peace building and you know about Africa and Asia. And like, you know, when I was starting as a, a grad student, I was like, oh, yeah, that seems like a reasonable approach. Well, and, and, and I mean, you would be an expert on Africa. I'm saying Africa because I'd never been on that continent, not even on a, you know, on a, on a vacation in Egypt, like most Europeans have been to uh, Tunisia and, and Egypt, at least. Uh, uh, but then, you know, there are 50 countries or so uh, on that continent. And at the end of the day, if you if you work in peace and conflict studies, you realize that every village is different. So you can mm -hmm. you can go that granular and, mm -hmm. and you can really spend a long time in one village uh, to understand the conflict dynamics of that place. So yeah, it's it's a bit of a, a paradox, I think. Yeah, I think this is a good a moment to segue into one of like the conceptual um, sort of pillars that of uh, let's say your your um, your work, um, uh, because I think we're already talking about it, which is the the idea of liberal peace building, mm -hmm. and um, in your uh, PhD thesis and in the the your book, this is a, a concept that you um, criticize and, and pick apart. So mm -hmm. let let's. Uh, start with the idea of, well what is liberal peace building it's like mm -hmm. kind of start with a definition and um you know, building up into where your critique comes from like mm -hmm. as they walk us through some of the history mm -hmm. of of the the idea of state building and and peace building and mm -hmm. what yeah what what defines liberal peace building okay first let me save you for anything else, that I'm actually a relative latecomer into the, uh, the the critique and criticism of the liberal peace. So, you know, I didn't invent the, the criticism of the liberal peace. Uh, no, I didn't invo po invent postmodernism, but I, I still talk about it, right? <laughs> Right, uh, but yeah, so so you know, I already built on a on a very substantial body of of research and and discussion about uh, what is the liberal peace and and what's wrong with the liberal peace uh, or what's good about it. Um, but uh, I specifically ended up talking a lot about it because I found that it does have a very serious, strong traction uh, in. Uh, local level peace building uh, in remote parts of the world. Uh, I, uh, for the PhD, I did field research in a in a quite remote area of the Philippines, um, in a small town where there is a communist insurgency. So, uh, and and ideas of the liberal peace were just all around me. Uh, sometimes spoken by people in a way that. Let me think that do they really understand or do they just, you know, repeat things or, you know, are these just like sort of received pieces of received wisdom, uh, you know, that that people just keep throwing around. So it has become so commonplace uh, that that I really felt like I had to, you know, uh, go and, and figure out where it's coming from and what is it about. My interest was actually local level peace building. Can you give uh, me an example of some of those received wisdom, like what kind of ideas or sound bites? 
uh, well, for those. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, for example, <clears throat> conflict is caused by poverty. Uh, and therefore, we need development uh, and we mm. need good governance uh, to facilitate uh, development. Now, right. That that sounds like the 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 conventional recipe. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And and you know everybody you talk to, uh, with few exceptions, will give you this recipe uh, uh, for you know peace. And people from the government said these things. People from villages where I you know, talk to people, they uh, they repeated uh, often this or, or a version of this um, uh, approach that uh, there needs to there need to be uh, institutions, uh, state institutions that function in a particular way uh, for uh, for development and peace to happen uh, and so on. So uh, so I OK, to, to define what I mean by liberal peace is basically the, the sort of the, what, I, what you could also call institutional peace building of big international uh, organizations like the United Nations, like the World Bank, uh, big international donors uh, and, and sort of core states. Um, uh, there is this sort of teleological idea underlying it, which I, I think is rooted to a significant degree in, in older modernization theories um, that, that, you know, countries have this sort of stadial uh, evolution that they go through these stages of development and eventually they become Germany. Uh, or, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so, um, or Sweden or Canada, uh, the United States, well, that that is a very strong meme as well. So um, uh, so so I think it is it is rooted in this in this idea um, uh, that that states and societies go through uh, this particular uh, evolution, which is characterized by state. And this is not a new idea. It's a very in very enlightenment. Idea. It goes back to uh, to late 19th, late 18th, early 19th century uh, thinking. Condorcet. If you look at Marxism, Marxism is is basically a stadial idea with its with its sort of breakdown of of uh, the the evolution of the class struggle. You know, from the uh, the hunter gatherer society to the slave holding society to the feudal economy to the capitalist economy and so on and then you know you have to go through these uh, stages um, so uh, uh, so there is that and then gerhard lansky had this very elaborate scheme in the 1960s i think so uh, so it's it's not a it's not a new idea it goes back to the enlightenment that we go through these stages. And I think uh, what we call the liberal peace is in that sense uh, an inheritor of this idea of stadial development, uh, which modernization theory was also a part of the, the sort of the, from the age of decolonization, like what do we do with these new states and, and how do we bring them up to uh, become developed states, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that is that source of the liberal peace. And uh, I think we ended up having the liberal peace. Well, okay, let me go back to the intellectual sources a little bit. Um, uh, we can't escape mentioning Johann Galtung, so let's just get it over with. So, uh, so, uh, so he had this. He had this uh, very influential article or a couple of articles. I think the first one was in the 1960s, where he lays out uh, sort of this well triangles, everything. So, uh, so he, the the peacekeeping, peace building, peacemaking uh, idea. So that's kind of where the peace building part came in that there is this activity that that we have to you know carry out uh, you know peacekeeping being this sort of physical uh, uh, you know separation of uh, fighting forces and peacemaking basically uh, mediation conflict resolution etc and then there is this sort of longer term activity that this peace building that he laid out already that early um, so I think I think it it its moment came when the Cold War ended. And I think the end of the Cold War is this pivotal moment. And, um, and uh, it is because uh, 
suddenly, and it was really just pure coincidence that it happened at a time of uh, Reaganism and Thatcherism. Uh, but but there was this sort of really ascendant idea uh, in the winning camp of the Cold War that that there is a particular uh, constellation of uh, social, mm. political, and economic uh, systems uh, that that has prevailed in this sort of you know uh, global conflict, and and somehow they really figured out uh, what is the secret to a prosperous, peaceful society. Yeah, this is the the end of history argument. Yes, well, yes. Although I have to say that I really, I really appreciate Fukuyama, and I think, I think his his article. I haven't read the book, but I read the article multiple times, and I really like his article. And I think he has been a bit maligned. A bit maligned, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. I think it's an actually a brilliant article. Uh, and if you look at the end of that article. He actually says that you know what, maybe people will get bored of it, and then history will begin again. Uh, so, uh, so that's how he ends the article. And lo and behold, people yeah. did get bored of it, and uh, and it's starting again. But but so there was this moment, I think, where uh, where first of all, peace building or that kind of deep intervention into internal wars. Because that's what peace building is about in the post Cold War period. It's deep intervention into internal affairs of conflict affected states. And uh, I mean, at that level, the liberal peace, I'm talking about the liberal peace. I'm not talking about nice, you know, local NGOs doing conflict transformation work, you know, that kind of stuff. So there is, uh, so there was this sort of moment at the end of the Cold War uh, where there was, there was a, a body of ideas present, uh, the idea of peace building from Galtung, uh, modernization theory and the subsequent ideas about how uh, economies, societies, polities develop. Um, uh, uh, and then the end of the Cold War meant that a space suddenly opened up for this kind of deep intervention into these countries. So in the Cold War, uh, it wasn't really possible because the UN Security Council could very rarely agree on such an intervention, if ever. Uh, but suddenly, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, suddenly that space opened up, and there was a clear winning side with its ideology and its and its absolutely at the time I think unshakable conviction that they figured it out, um, and and. Uh, and these things came together in this particular moment in time. If, for example, uh, the Cold War drags on for another five, ten years, and maybe you know uh, Reaganism or Thatcherism, you know, is showed up as you know uh, not so perfect, uh, you know, systems to organize a society. Uh, then we would have we would be having something completely different. Or if it happens, you know, ten years before. Uh, it would be very different, mm -hmm. but it happened in that particular moment in time, and I think this is just you know it's it's pure chance or randomness that that it happened right there at that historical junction when there was this ascendance of what we call neoliberalism, and here I think both the economic liberalism and the political liberalism are significant, um, and the possibility that this kind of intervention could happen. Uh, so to me. Liberal peace building is is this idea that there is a particular configuration of politics, economics, um, ideology that can that can produce peaceful societies. I think that's that to me is, and it happens to be a liberal or actually a neoliberal uh, understanding of uh, of peace building. And because of this, if you look at the uh, the, the trust and the efforts of these big interventions uh, driven by the UN, driven by major international donors from the US, Canada, Sweden, Germany, France, what have you, um, typically Western European or North American countries, uh, to a lesser extent Asian donors like Japan and, and Korea, I think they, they have a slightly different approach uh, to this and not to mention now China. Uh, but in that 1990s, 2000s, and up to now, basically, it has been dominated by these Wallersteinian core states of the North Atlantic, and uh, and uh, it's it's this deep social transformation. I mean, I think 
not that I reflect on it. I think partly my personal interest comes from being uh, on the on the losing side or coming from the losing side of this sort of apocal yeah. conflict, and uh, and actually, uh, arguably, the biggest single uh, experiment in social engineering humankind has ever attempted is the capitalist transformation of the former Eastern Bloc, ranging from, you know, Prague and, and Dresden or like East Berlin all the way to Vladivostok. Uh, and, you know, all the countries of Central Asia and like that huge vast space uh, is arguably the biggest single attempt to completely remake uh, human societies uh, in, one, in one image, like based on one single vision. Because mm -hmm. colonization arguably, you know, affects a bigger territory, but there were different visions over time and in space. Mm -hmm. But here, mm -hmm. this was a very um, concentrated attempt at doing that. And I think peace building in some ways is the, the logical counterpart in conflict affected, typically post-colonial countries mm. of what the West tried to do where I'm from. Uh, so there is that that uh, sort of personal interest in in what's happening with this. Um, yes. Oh, just, sure. just just to kind of catch that and 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 to summarize it because I think that's like uh, that's a, a quite a, a thesis statement and um, and a super interesting topic. That so you're saying that you think that there there is the, that the peace building as a project is. A parallel in conflict um, or post-colonial settings to the I don't even know what exactly to call it, but like the, um, the democratization. The, the democratization of the 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 um, um, the the project of free market capitalism in the former Soviet Union. And satellite states, yes. And satellite states, uh, Central yeah, Europe yeah. and Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah. Or, right. Sorry, Central Asia and, and uh, yeah, Eastern yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, yes. And and I think, yes. I mean, it's not necessarily consciously, but sort of the ideological foundations and the, the content of it is really the same thing. Uh, yeah, and I think it's even more interesting if it's not done consciously, right? Because mm. that's our, our, say, our part of our jobs as if we're doing these kind of like. Ac uh, academicians, scholars, researchers, is to think about those things. Yeah. And so, if it, if it is unconscious, I, I well, maybe that's my kind of personal opinion on it, but I I find that makes it even more interesting. You know, like, yes. Well, what what is going on that's driving this? Because it's because it it's tapping into some kind of um, I don't know, deep need or, or psychological um, uh, phenomenon that's that's pushing it. Well, look, uh, I think it's it's a kind of Zizekian ideology. Mm -hmm. Like that was that very short, nice little piece. I don't know. You may have read it yourself. Um, uh, I think in the run up to the, the war on Iraq, Donald Rumsfeld gave an interview. And it was quite a famous interview where he uh, where they asked him about the, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And, uh, mm -hmm. and obviously, as we know now, and some of some people already were quite convinced back then that he was lying through his teeth. But mm. uh, he said that there are things that we know that we know, <laughs> you know, I, yes. So, you know, you remember that, mm. that, yeah. are, that you know, we know the, the known that, knowns and, and the unknown it, knowns and uh, the unknown uh, unknowns. Yes, exactly. So, yes, but yeah. that is and then Zizek wrote this that, you know, that is a fourth thing. Uh, the things that we don't know that we know, yes. <laughs> and that's yeah. what he called ideology. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, I get you. Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's 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 what that's what he wrote. That's the things we don't know that we know, and I think mm. this is this is this sort of Jackian ideology uh, that, that I think a lot of people, and not only leaders of of you know the the winning side of. Uh, of the Cold War, uh, but even a lot of you know common, normal, everyday people like like us were really convinced about it. And I think not only in the West, I think in the East as well. I think I think there was a lot of uh, belief, especially in particular circles. I definitely grew up totally buying into this when I was a, when I was a teenager. Uh, it 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 took me a bit more exposure to realize that maybe it isn't quite as I 
had thought before. Uh, uh, but being a teenager, you know, in, in late Cold War, early post Cold War, uh, Hungary, I absolutely bought into this project myself, this sort of neoliberal democratization of, of Hungary in my case. Um, and then, uh, and then as I started reading and interacting with people from elsewhere and so on, <clears throat> I changed my mind, basically. I moved away from that idea and, uh, and that's how I ended up providing a certain criticism of, of uh, the liberal peace building. And, uh, and I think an interesting, and this is where I think I wrote a little bit about it, and maybe I should at some point write more. Um, I think there is this sort of, uh, because a lot has been written about uh, the liberal ideology of the liberal peace. Uh, economic liberalism, you know, free market economies, uh, austerity, uh, small government or small state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think there is also a, an inherent statism uh, mm -hmm. in it, and and statism to me is this sort of unquestioned idea that the state is the default organizer of a society, the modern state, mm -hmm. and and. Uh, I think there is quite a bit of research around uh, how state building impacts communities and impacts societies and how it generates conflict. Uh, but I think what's not really scrutinized, and I didn't do enough in my thesis uh, uh, to scrutinize the ideology itself or question the ideology, but I think it's important to see that there is this idea that we think of the state as an unquestioned uh, good. Uh, or as an unquestioned default organizer of a society. And I think it greatly limits our capacity to imagine uh, uh, peaceful societies, especially because I, I come from a somewhat state skeptic, uh, anarchistic standpoint, mm. uh, where, uh, where I actually see the state as the source of an immense amount of, uh, of violence uh, and, and the concentration of violence. Uh, so, uh, so to me, it has always been, for, or has for a long time been, uh, a paradox in this sort of institutional uh, state-focused peace building project uh, that, that we hope to bring about peace by creating uh, uh, something that is, in, in its, is itself a concentration of violence. Uh, uh, a structure whose primary function is to uh, to concentrate and use violence uh, in society. So I think that is a fundamental paradox in this kind of uh, mm -hmm. peace building. Uh, and that is kind of how I ended up with this, because I have this sort of non-statist or anti-statist way of looking at this, and that's that's kind of that's another reason that that my interest sort of came in this direction. I was wanting to ask you a little bit more about that, and, and then you 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 dived right into <laughs> this idea of the 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 unknown known, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're calling ideology, and I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought of it in those terms before, and I, I like that as as like a, a it's a good didactic tool. Of like mm -hmm. talking to talking maybe students or you know, people like what is an ideology and so the things you know that you don't realize that you know exactly right? yeah. it's the, the guiding principle behind it <clears throat> yeah and I think that that you I think that you really hit the nail on the head of this idea of uh, of um, the 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 centrality of the state I mean and this has been like throughout my uh, educational career in peace studies this was always like uh, an idea behind it and also uh, a criticism of the peace building project is that like is is that you always have this um sort of unavoidable centrality of the nation state I mean, like the mm -hmm. united nations is a perfect example like it's nation states right? yes and 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 it's a it's a it's a club of nation states and um you know like things that aren't nation states um aren't represented like, and it, this is a you know, go back to the formation of like, you know, was the 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 Hanseatic League invited to the Peace of Westphalia? And like, well, that's kind of a, and it was a bit of a, a longer process than that, but it's, it's one that's always pointed to as the, the the kind of a starting point of of our current like global world system. Mm -hmm. um, and 
so going to this idea, like one of the things that I that I really um, kind of liked about your in in your in your the text of your thesis and the introduction is that one of the things you're pointing out is that this idea of the ideology of statism and this kind of conflation of peace building and state building is is under theorized, and um, and I know you you just kind of mentioned that, but maybe you could like dig into that a little bit more like what do you mean by under theorized and and what what would you like to see then well yeah but of, I, perhaps in terms of scholarship but also just say kind of philosophically i think uh, i think under theorized here uh, really means this this sort of uh, the fact that that this idea of what we the statist ideology itself, you know, its 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 content has not really been explored, and I didn't do a proper job in exploring that myself because that's not what my thesis was about. I somehow got into that uh, uh, to that idea as I was doing my research. Uh, so what I would really like to see here uh, is a uh, is sort of more anarchist peace research, more uh, yeah. more research on uh, on on how we can uh, conceive of societies that are peaceful or more peaceful than the current ones or or at least that you know we'll have conflicts but they are not they don't have to fall back to this violent institution or institutional mm -hmm. ensemble that is the state so that's kind of that to me would be a really interesting research agenda that i would like to see uh, and maybe I will have to do something about it myself eventually. Uh, uh, but it's really difficult because in some ways this statism is, is it's a bit like, you know, the air that we breathe uh, mm -hmm. in some ways. I mean, one, one going back a little bit to the, to the liberal state uh, idea, I think there is this, there is an interesting tension within it because uh, uh, some people uh, point out that uh, that the liberal uh, the liberal piece and and I had this this discussion with somebody before that the liberal piece is actually anti-statist said this uh, oh. this uh, scholar and uh, because at fair point uh, it really tried to put everything in these uh, in these loci of intervention in the hands of NGOs. Uh, mm. non-state entities. Mm -hmm. So there is this sort of NGOization, which is extremely mm -hmm. problematic in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's really liberal in the sense that it, it seeks to create a small state and it doesn't trust the state. And that was this scholar's argument that, uh, mm -hmm. that there is a distrust in liberal peace building of the state. But and I think it's a fair point and, uh, and it made me think afterwards. And I think that it actually had a distrust in the states where it was intervening. So it's not a distrust in the concept of the state itself. Yeah. That is, there was yeah. a distrust in those faulty states that need to be reinforced. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that 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 mm -hmm. had to be, uh, you know, built up properly to be proper states yeah. and you couldn't rely on the state itself to build itself up because it was uh, corrupt it was uh, nepotistic it was uh, patrimonial it was you know all these bad things uh, and therefore uh, you you used uh, ngos to develop that uh, state uh, but then so that i think there is this tension and i think it's actually a real tension which at the time when i wrote the thesis and the book I wasn't really fully aware of. So mm. this kind of idea of this tension came from that subsequent discussion uh, that I had with this person, mm -hmm. uh, and and it mm -hmm. was a fair point. Uh, so I think that is that is that is a kind of uh, mistrust in the state, but it's not in the state as an organizer of human societies itself. It's mm. just a mistrust in states that are not liberal democratic. Uh, capitalist states that function yeah. along certain lines. Um, yeah. uh, so that is that is a question, a lot of questioning of state building in a sense of of uh, you know its oppressiveness or you know it's uh, like if you look at James C. Scott seeing like a state that is 
I don't know if you've read that book, but if you haven't, then I highly recommend. It's one of my favorite books um, where he where he talks about, you know, the the, the highly the high modern state uh, as something that seeks to uh, create a society which is visible to it. Uh, and legible to it, and therefore yeah. seeks to uh, reduce the inherent complexity and messiness of societies into clear lines. And uh, and I think that's kind of the idea as well, to make these states visible to the external eye, uh, which is this external intervener eye. And, oh. uh, and uh, you have to deputize entities that you trust to do it and those in this case were the NGOs but but uh, and that that generates uh, within those societies a significant amount of of uh, disruption and and uh, dislocation uh, because you reconstitute these societies in order to match the state so you kind of take the superstructure as a given you, you build the superstructure, but you, but as you build the superstructure, it requires uh, a transformation of the substructure itself. So that's how it becomes this top-down approach. And I think people have criticized it quite a bit, the disruption that it creates and, and the misery and the, and the oppressiveness of these state-building uh, exercises. But I haven't really seen attempts at questioning the state as an organizer of human societies itself and uh, you know maybe at this stage it's it's kind of a, a futile intellectual exercise or well not futile but you know a bit of a a lar pur lar sort of thing because uh, we are 8 billion people and uh, and we already have states so the thing mm -hmm. about states is once you have them it's really difficult to abandon them because they are extremely useful uh, to mm -hmm. control populations and and concentrate power and you know all these things uh, but i think it would still be an important thing to somehow expand our our imagination beyond uh, the state when we think about peace and peace building yeah i i think that uh, as I've uh, you know <clears throat> heard before is that most people don't think that anarchy is a bad idea. They think it's an absolutely insane idea. And so like the the idea of of really criticizing the the superstructure, we'll call it of the, of the the nation state and of a global order based on nation states is um, is um, difficult. <clears throat> and I think that you could be that that be because, uh, part of what will go with that is to say, well, if you're criticizing this thing that we have, well, what do you propose in its place? And and that's <clears throat> a difficult question because they say, well, I, you know, I maybe mean, I don't have the answer, but like people will figure something out. And the 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 long span of human um, <clears throat> history has shown that that people have been very creative in figuring out how to mm -hmm. organize society and and do things. And it's not just like. <clears throat> This, the, like you said, this the teleological progression of hunter gatherers to uh, modern nation states. And anyone who actually studies ancient uh, um, peoples or anthropology, uh, um, archaeology will see that that there's anything you can imagine has pretty mm -hmm. much been tried somewhere. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, we're kind of going down another rabbit hole there, um, but I wanted to just point out that. I think the 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 kind of criticism that you're bringing up of like the the NGOs is exactly the same line that you might see in um, like economics as well. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, don't touch the superstructure, um, but say that the, the the problem is is the is the how it's implemented in the in this small um, mm -hmm. ways. So that you might say, well, we don't want to trust like the state to run. Um, uh, state-run nationalized corporations <clears throat> um, in like a, a, a socialist uh, model, um, but we want to say a, a bunch of small businesses or a kind of like middle stand of of, of medium-sized businesses. That's more trustworthy. It sounds like it, there's a real parallel of of deflecting criticism from the the superstructure from the state to mm -hmm. all the the actors and how they 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 go mm -hmm. through. The, and I, I found that this. A profoundly like a kind of postmodern argument in, the, in this sense of like um, it's it's like um, it's not the it's not the overall system that is is broken. It's that it's like that 
you're not paying enough taxes, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like big, it's like, you know, that's what it comes down to. Like big corporations are able to find loopholes and not pay taxes. So it, like, it's not like the superstructure of the nation state is that it's not functioning at, at the way it should. And I think that comes back to this question of idealism, right? If mm -hmm. something is not functioning as it should, then, then it, you think, well, why should it work that way if it's not in practice? Mm -hmm. Right, because yeah. then, and then you're upholding some ideal that it should work this way, but it but it's, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So um, I think yeah, maybe we'll, we can um, switch to, to or circle back to one of the questions that we wanted to talk to way back in the beginning, um, which is your experience as a theory or, or as a practitioner and um, a theorist and um, uh, Noah had some ideas about what to uh, ask you about that. Uh, one of the reasons I thought it would be interesting to hear your reflections on this is um, I've also thought a lot about this question and I don't know if you share a similar experience to myself but being a hybrid practitioner academic scholar practitioner however you want to call it is something that always seemed like oh yeah it's of course a good idea like you should think and do but then the more I try to do it, I, I can't tell if it if there's something wrong with the idea or if the incentive structures are not aligned in a way that supports people to do that. So what what are, what are your thoughts on peace practitioner scholars? Um, we have to build big institutions. <laughs> you know, I think they are important. Well, institutions yeah. are important because they are not the same as the state. But but uh, you know so. So there was this really difficult uh, aspect of working as a practitioner after I spent, you know, more than a decade uh, developing my thoughts about, you know, what's wrong with all of this. Um, at the same time, working as a practitioner uh, also developed my empathy for people a great deal. Mm. Uh, you know, their everyday sort of, you know, work and what they need to do and what are the constraints mm. uh, about NGOism or, uh, you know, NGOization and all of these things. So, so I, I've also become in some ways, I think my criticism is better informed, but it's also more, I also have more empathy. So in some ways I'm less uh, cruel in my criticism, more uh, empathetic. Uh, in my critique mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. of these things, because I because I I I, I really see, uh, you know, the good intentions in a lot of people who end up, you know, contributing to terrible structures and uh, and and you know the ways people try to you know find their way within these structures and still do some good when you know the whole system is basically you know evolved for self-preservation. So kind of whatever you do, you contribute to building the system. And then, and that, but you still try to somehow challenge it and the extreme difficulty of that. Um, so so I, I, I've developed this, this empathy for, uh, for people, which, which I think if you don't step out from, uh, from being a critical scholar or a critical thinker, then it's really easy to become, you know, very harsh and very un inconsiderate of these daily realities of, of people, you know, struggling to, to make some kind of change uh, in, an, in an incredibly complex uh, system. Uh, so at that level, I, I think I've developed this, this sort of empathy. So it made me, it mellowed me uh, somehow, my criticism um, to a significant extent. But I could also, I also had a certain, all kinds of ideas that I could actually put into practice. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so obviously, I needed I needed the collaboration of my of my supervisor for this um, and the NGO where I worked. But uh, I, I really had these ideas about you know um, you know putting local people at the center of things, uh, not internationals, and and mm. sort of I really hate this word, but. If you know a better word, then tell me what what should I use instead of empower people because <laughs> it's a horrible word. But you know, like 
to 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 position my local colleagues in a way that they could have a much more significant influence on how we build strategy, how we run the organization, and so on and so forth. So it's much less yeah. externally driven and much more locally driven. For example, I think you just answered your question of how to say it. <laughs> okay. Using the yes. word empower. <laughs> Yes, it's just a sentence, not a word, but, but yeah. yes. Uh, but yes, so that's kind of, so, so I was able to work on these things. Uh, I also have these sort of, you know, leftist ideas of improving people's uh, working conditions mm. and, and so on. So I, I, I did improve the working conditions of my colleagues uh, uh, to a significant extent, I think, in many ways not just in terms of salaries and other perks of the job, but in terms of you know, dignity and 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 uh, and self satisfaction in their work. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a country director of an NGO, so uh, now I'm a consultant. So I actually, my wife is <laughs> having a, a good time laughing at me because I went from academia straight to country director, so I could just delegate a lot of the, <laughs> the menial jobs. And now that I'm a consultant, I actually have to do all those menial <laughs> things. Now. So I do everything a little bit, you know backwards i think uh, so those 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 things that i came that came from my critical uh, scholarship and my ideology mm. uh, i could actually you know make some of those things reality mm -hmm. uh, in the mm. organization so mm. that that was really that was really good and and that also proved me that you know you can do things better uh, mm -hmm. it's possible even within these systems um, mm. but of course the system is has evolved for self-preservation. So, sure. uh, you know, it's still, I still haven't triggered the revolution. And that's <laughs> maybe what we should be doing. Uh, so, yes. So that, that to me, but it's, it's, it's really difficult uh, in this sense, because uh, if you are a critical scholar, then I think it's difficult. If you're a problem solver type scholar, then it's much easier. But I don't think anybody mm. in this call is firmly rooted in that tradition. <laughs> So, you mean the three of us? <laughs> three of us, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So we might have different perspectives on things. I'm, I'm very much, you know, a materialist, so I'm, I'm interested in material uh, things. Uh, but I, but I think that neither of us is, is, is exactly a, a, a problem solver in the sense that uh, we have little interest in critiquing the system in which we function, questioning it. So, well, and one yeah. of the questions I always reflect on when looking at this swinging back and forth between practitioner and scholar, particularly when you, you do that journey a few times, mm -hmm. is then it makes me reconsider what is peace education really about? Mm. Whereas I had often thought of it much more in a very like heavy critical theory, deep peace thinking perspective. And then after doing a lot of practice, I realized like, you know, if I taught people to use Excel really well and to like write a proposal and a topic sentence, this is actually a skill that you're using every yes. day for most peace work. So where, where does education for peace work really fit? Mm. I think that's a very fair point, but I also, and I think speaking of peace education as a discipline and as a pedagogy and as an approach uh, to, to education, I think it has the potential to be the, you know, the most revolutionary mm. uh, thing in our entire field, you know, questioning, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, structures of violence and systems of violence and mm. cultures of violence and all of that. So it can be a really sort of revolutionary uh, thing and a really subversive thing at one level. Uh, but what I saw as a practitioner in my daily life is actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not talking about uh, about teaching them Excel and writing a, a, a you know a correct sentence in whatever language, um, uh, but more as a as a pedagogy and a pedagogical tool. I've seen a lot of peace education, which were actually pacification. Uh, sort of tokenistic, superficial, you know, pacifying, uh, uh, you know, otherwise marginalized populations and uh, and uh, and transmit, uh, uh, you know, the the ideas of of uh, the supremacy of the state, mm -hmm. and so on. So I've seen a lot of that called peace education. And, uh, you know, I think that actually does a lot of harm. I mean, the worst things that I've seen is soldiers in uniforms going to elementary schools to do peace education. 
Yeah. So that to me was like, okay, hmm, that's not what I imagined it to be, but apparently this is how we roll now. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, so that, that is, that is, that's a very cute cat. What is <laughs> he or she called? Yes. Yeah. So yes, so that, yes, but yes, it, it, it is, it is a good question. And I think, I think, I mean, as an educator and somebody who has been involved in higher education, one of the many things that kill me about uh, about the current state of affairs in higher education is this idea that uh, people should go to universities to get a job, to get marketable skills. I think that that is just the, the total devastation and destruction of the idea of the university. And I think that's definitely not what why people should get an education. Um, yeah. Having said that, there are these life skills that we need to do when we do a job, and I think that needs to be learned as well. But but if if you reduce the education to that, then I think something quite important is being missed. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we'll bookmark that that thought because one of the things that uh, uh, I would like to do and and uh, discuss with with <clears throat> Noah is to actually have a, another conversation with you in the n near to mid future uh, exactly on that topic of um, the criticism of the university <clears throat> because I think all of us uh, all the, the three of us have a, a, a similar and maybe unique um, insider outsider perspective on the university and some of the the um, necessary criticisms of the of the current system <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, and and I like what you you said. That, you know, that's a criticism that I share of of the the idea of going to university to get a job, and I think, to me also philosophically, it connects into this the 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 core maybe ideas or of what is peace studies in its in itself because it comes to the questions of like, well, what is the good life? What is um, what is you know wor worthwhile doing? What are we doing all this for? And I think that what you said flips the the historical idea of of a, of a good life on its head. Is that mm. you? Because I think that for for me, I want to have wealth so that I can do things that are worthwhile, like to spend more time, um, um, you know, pursuing beauty and truth and 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 art and 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 fun and even hedonism, you know, um, um, rather than um, um, pursuing knowledge in order to gain wealth. But then for what? And I think is the is mm. the, the the question. So if you gain knowledge or go to university to um, um, just to be able to get a, to get a job, um, so that to 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 meet your financial needs, then um, you know what what is what is the what is beyond your own like say, material life. <laughs> that you're working for hmm. well, and I think I mean, ultimately yeah. all human beings need something right that that uh, purpose our um um some uh, engagement beyond the self yes i yeah of course i fully agree and uh, yeah and i mean this is i mean <clears throat> this is this is it's no coincidence that the questions that you mentioned uh, about the good life and all of the the things that surround it that that you touched upon mm -hmm. uh, uh, tend to be taught in the framework of what we call humanities, and I think it's not uh, uh, it's not coincidental that uh, humanities departments are being closed down <laughs> across the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and and like, there is a lot of yeah. uh, there is a lot of you know effort to increase STEM education, and I think STEM is great, and I think super important. Uh, I just don't think that it should be done at the expense of the humanities. And I think it doesn't need to be done at the expense of humanities. And I think the elimination of humanities is actually this kind of, well, some maybe maybe intentional, maybe ideological, like in this sort of unknown known way that, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, engineers don't need to read Foucault. There. But actually, I think they do. Oh well, yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't get me wrong. I think I, I, yes. that, that would be my, uh, my my position as well. Yes, exactly. So I mean, I, recently I've been working uh, quite a bit on conflict sensitivity, 
and and uh, and I think engineers in particular need to uh, need to have an understanding of of you know uh, ethics and and societies and so on because what they do has a very direct significant impact on the lives of people. So and so I think I think these ethical questions of you know what that impact is is I think quite important and I think I don't think that engineers. Uh, I don't think people become engineers because somehow instinctively they refuse to think about those things. I think the overwhelming majority of engineers is capable of this kind of thinking. Yeah. They're just, they're just, it's just somehow it's either the they're never knows. exposed to it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's either never exposed, they either never exposed to this or actually deliberately uh, educated against this kind of thinking. Yeah, I, is and it is a, yeah I, I do think if, if the, the um, engineers that were working on autonomous killer robots <laughs> in, in uh, like are reading um, you know postmodern uh, philosophy reading about totalitarianism and fascism they really would rethink you know what they're what the, what they're creating and mm. why they're creating it and I uh, so yeah. Maybe, I, yeah, exactly. But maybe, also, you know, but, maybe. But, but, but you know, I just think of a, a regular uh, civil engineer yeah. building a road. Yeah, yeah. You know, we don't even need to go so exotic as as autonomous killing robots. Uh, it's just, you know, where do you build a dam? Do you build yeah. a dam in the first place, or do you do something else? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do you build a road in a particular uh, direction, or following a particular route, or another? I think these are very uh, these are really everyday questions because the yeah. autonomous killer robot is, is you know, done by a handful of uh, engineers and scientists. But but these things that affect everyday lives of of people, I think that's ubiquitous. I think that's everywhere. Yeah, I always thought that you know this textbook that was often used, the contemporary conflict resolution book the that has um, at all. Yeah, that has the the most dire bridge on on the cover. Uh huh. Yeah. And it like throughout the different editions up to the fourth edition, like you see progress as the bridge was made or reconstructed over time. Ah, I never I, I never noticed that because I don't think I have all the editions. I think I've <laughs> seen the 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 second and the fourth somehow. Well, and I always th thought that you know, there's of course the maybe superficial level of like reconnecting. That's what is being communicated through the image but I always thought that that is the more interesting question um, is what you're bringing up is like all the things that go into the the peace building concepts behind something is seemingly solely in the domain of civic engineering is building a bridge between one bank and the other bank all of the you know, historical implications it has and to, for all the way down to the level of who you're employing to do it how you do it and mm -hmm. Exactly. And I've only recently seen the, and I must confess, when I first saw the, the term, I cringed until I understood what it was. It was this peace engineering is now actually a term that is mm -hmm. being used. I thought of it as a little bit like this being in a nefarious way, but it really, it was referring to this idea of teaching engineers mm -hmm. like as peace lens. And I think this is really yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's one of the things that idea. should be in the peace curriculum yeah, or, and the engineering curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, we actually we actually try to do something with this with these ideas when I was a practitioner, and this was this is an idea that I could bring in. I don't think it came into fruition. I think I was just ahead of my time. Uh, but but uh, we really try to work uh, or like develop some work with universities uh, in this exact direction to work with with STEM people and. Uh, and uh, and we had this project idea which was very uh, ambitious, and then I had to leave the organization for family reasons, uh, so I didn't couldn't see it through, and I don't know what came of it or what became of it. Uh, but this idea of of uh, working with universities to somehow uh, transform the university itself uh, along more peaceful lives that 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 peace is mainstreamed across the university as a whole mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah yeah i think that it, it that could be really an interesting cool. idea
Yeah, ever having a, a conversation with a colleague of a, so something like that, of like having a kind of like maybe conflict resolution course as like mandatory for all, um, say, I don't know, first year students or something like that. Well, that would be a first step, but that would still be a compartmentalized thing. It's like, you know, yeah. I studied law and we had like, I think two semesters of statistics. And it, it was one of those subjects that, you know, and the two semesters of Latin because, you know, in Europe, because of Roman you have to understand law, what you have to... quid pro quo means. Exactly, yes. So, uh, and these were the, the subjects, you know, that everybody who studied law, we had to take. And then you you got through with the, the base minimum grade, you know, to pass. And then you completely forgot about it. Uh, so uh, so I think, I think when you mainstream it, maybe it would be another conversation to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, to, to kind of mainstream it across the university, uh, including, you know, uh, mainstreaming these ideas into into how the student union is formed or whatever mm. body of students there is, how they interact with the uh, with the Senate of the university or whatever governing body a university has, uh, and then how it's uh, integrated into specific subjects, like, for example, in engineering subjects or, or how ethics uh, is not a standalone subject, you know, because that, and you know, people like, yeah, Aristotle said this, and and Kant said that, and and mm. I don't know, Schopenhauer said this, and we should all just, you know, die now uh, or something, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so you know, so not something compartmentalized, but something that somehow baked into uh, mm. the whole thing. It's extremely difficult, but I think mm. it would be really transformative. Mm -hmm. Um, as we're already talking about these ideas of, uh, of like projects and, and mainstreaming piece in the STEM education, um, one of the things that I'm I've really been curious about over the last number of years, and so I always ask anyone um, that I come across uh, within peace studies, is like where do you think the discipline or like the area of study uh, is is headed? Like, what do you think is coming up in the future as being a big topic? And what do you think are areas or topics that are really important that aren't getting the attention that they deserve right now? I think I, in, the, in the near future, I, I still see more fragmentation. I don't think there will be a, a clear direction. I don't think that's a bad thing, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, I think it's still going to be a very eclectic uh, field of research uh, mm -hmm. where where people doing, you know, uh, preventing and countering violent extremism type research will call themselves peace researchers. And I will want to have nothing to do with them because I wouldn't touch that thing, uh, even with a long uh, stick. Uh, and then, you know, there will be I think there will continue to be research on, you know, uh, which was a which was a hip topic uh, 10, 15 years ago, you know, like these indigenous uh, conflict resolution, conflict transformation mm. approaches. And mm. I haven't really seen much of that lately, but I mm. foresee a comeback uh, to those because because there was, you know, this sort of local piece. Uh, or the local and localized peace building and mm -hmm. so on topics and hybridity and then there was this sort of criticism and now it's sort of like going down uh, hybridity and the locality but I think one direction from there is really going back to the basics again so I think there would be another round of, of that. Possibly. What do you mean by basics? Uh, like really the foundations of society like like grassroots communities and okay. uh, and that that not 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 the theoretical basics, but like the mm. basis of society, like the really like the actual society, not uh, you know like like real people, like uh, so ethics of the state, <laughs> maybe the, <laughs> the theme of the day. Right? Well, maybe maybe, uh, but yes. Yeah, so I could I could see that topic uh, come back, and parallelly, I think you know like the fallout of Afghanistan. Uh, and, you know, all of these, I think, will continue to generate that kind of more international relations uh, influenced, uh, you know, re peace research on, you know, interventions and how to do interventions better. Mm -hmm. 
that that kind of stuff will will, will be around again. I think mm. because of Afghanistan primarily. Um, yeah. So that's this is. So I think I think it's I think it's it's not going. I don't think there will be like one direction. I think there will be like all kinds of topics coming up. Uh, on these different ends, like sort of the really macro level, and then and then again the very micro level, because there was this really really good point in in an article by Gerald Millar. I don't know if you if you've come across him. He's an Irish uh, scholar, uh, and um, I really like his work. He's done a lot on on hybridity, but but uh, uh, but he's quite critical of the concept of hybridity while at the same time developing it. And and that is in one of his articles. There is this thing that the concept of hybridity actually uh, is a, a very convenient way for you know Western scholars to reassert their relevance uh, in in the local peace building. Because if everything is hybrid, then part of it is from me. Therefore, I'm an expert <laughs> on it. Basically, that's what he says, and I think that's a very good point. And I think this mm. is, you know, one thing that I would really like to see uh, is actually more diversity, uh, but, but like real diversity uh, mm. coming out. So there is, I always get this criticism that, you know, your syllabus should be more diverse, mm. but, uh, but there is very little epistemic diversity, I think. Uh, okay. in in yeah. the field in a sense that so at one point a student wrote that you know like i i feel that your syllabus is not diverse enough and it's like too white male and okay i'm an eastern european 46 year old guy so a 20 something year old american girl is living in a different planet but then me or i live on a different planet but having said that um I pointed out that actually this and this and this person is a woman. Uh, it's just you don't know that from a from a family name. Uh, mm. And these and these and these persons are not actually Western people. And mm. she was somehow satisfied with that uh, to some extent. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the epistemic diversity, they all write in English. Mm. Yeah. Uh, they all need to publish at respectable publishers. So. Mm -hmm. It's already very limited. They all work. They already work in uh, in at Western universities, mostly mm -hmm. in Western countries. Uh, so 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 it, you end up with this very superficial diversity, where you know you have people who ha who have different uh, uh, phenotypes, uh, but in terms of their uh, intellectual output. They are forced to be in the same mold or, or very similar mold mm -hmm. at the, at the end of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would be really nice to see more like you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 and it goes back to the question of higher education and you mm -hmm. know is valued in higher education and the whole mm -hmm. like uh, I don't know uh, system of of assessing the 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 quality of the work of a scholar and you know promotions and tenures and all of that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know so uh, if if we could somehow overcome a lot of this then then more ideas could become part of the discussion Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to throw out the entire peer review system because I think it's an important thing, uh, but but it also, the way it currently functions, our publishing system and our university promotion systems, uh, uh, they they really force a particular homogeneity on, on, on how we think and how we publish and what we publish. Uh, I mean, you can... You can cut this out, but you know, like your your, but I mean, like your struggles to find a publisher, Noah, yeah. for for a book that you know, based on what you described, is is really fascinating mm. stuff. Yeah, uh, it, it was uh, a struggle. Yeah, you know, that's that to that to me shows that there is a there is a problem mm -hmm. uh, in in that sense. So this is this is this is where I think I would like to see more diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, epistemological diversity, and you know, maybe I will find it outlandish because mm. I come from where I come from. Uh, but at least we can have a we can have a conversation yeah. mm -hmm. uh, about mm -hmm. these things. So that's what yeah. I would like to see. I don't know if I if we will see that, uh, but uh, but I would really like to see the opening up of uh, of 
uh, of the space to ideas which are not forced into uh, a very few schemes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I fall into. I found a very. I found the publisher very easily because I fall into a scheme much better than 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 you do, for example. Uh, but I'm trying to imagine, you know, uh, a Muslim uh, scholar coming from a rural university somewhere uh, with their ideas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> forget about it. I mean, or 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 even or even a Chinese. Uh, or East Asian scholar with like basing it, their argument on just you know their own epistemology or Chinese philosophy, uh, uh, which I'm totally ignorant about. So you know, but it's difficult, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and it would be really hard for that person to come through this system and end up in my syllabus. When you think like how many how many journals are we talking about out there? Ten. 12 maximum that would accept yeah, yeah, yeah. peace studies ish papers. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. But even if we take it, take it, you know, broader and include like international relations and anthropology and so on. But, uh, but even there, you know, it's pretty much uh, uh, in the same mold. Like there are, you know, and you know, if you want to be postmodern, then, you know, there are like five journals for you and then you will publish there. If you are, uh, if you are, I don't know, a realist IR scholar with an interest in peace and conflict that you will publish there. And uh, if you have a development studies background, then you will publish uh, here. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think the diversity is not really great. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I agree with the things you're saying, and and I also think that, like, like you're pointing out, it, there's a kind of paradox of like, of how can you actually get that kind of um, um, epistemological diversity <clears throat> when you have so many um, so many filters mm -hmm. being, like, and and economics and financial is also a, a huge one. There's so the like class base and, and who actually gets to be in the university system and publish and stay alive in it and and I think that's a it's a good like uh, also a good segue because at least for me personally and that's why no one I have been doing this is to, to try to try to do something um, Brent with our like academic output that's not a, a a a paper and hopefully is um more accessible to people hmm. because it's there's you know we're still beholden to uh, uh the youtube and and google <laughs> at least if we're posting it mm -hmm. on youtube um but but theoretically anyone with a with an internet connection and a good knowledge of english can um tune in <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right that's right um, it's, it's but not behind a springer paywall you know mm. on that course. Uh, that's that's another question, you know. Mm -hmm. Will it be, yeah? Uh, how respectable will these things be uh, in the, you know, the hallowed halls of mm -hmm. academia? Yeah, but... not very. But I'm not concerned. <laughs> yeah. about that. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. But yes. Yeah, so that. But these these channels are there. I agree. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to, I can't put this conversation into a syllabus. Mm -hmm. You know. That's kind of what I'm thinking in terms of higher education. Right. I mean, I can show it if, if I want to, um, but uh, but I still have to include as required readings, you know, the peer-reviewed uh, articles and, and yeah. book chapters and so on. So I think I think there is this. I think this is this is this is a problem. And, and I'm not against filters as such. I think mm. there is uh, intellectual rigor uh, is a very important thing. But I also don't think that intellectual rigor can only be found or has to conform necessarily to a particular uh, way of doing scholarship. Yeah, because then it has a homogenizing effect. And yeah, then, exactly. you know, what's really the point of reading 20 articles that even if they're written by different people reflect essentially the same way of thinking? Well, or something similar. I mean, there are interesting articles because there are so many that some of them inevitably <laughs> yeah. are going to be interesting. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it's not that earth shattering a lot mm -hmm. of things. yeah and that, that includes what i do by the way so you know, it's, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say that i'm better than anyone <laughs> else it's just how it is mm -hmm. and i don't think it'll come from me it will come from people who come from very different intellectual traditions mm -hmm. and that's what i would like to see I, th I mean one of the questions we always like to kind of end on is if whatever if there's anything you want to say about what you're currently working on now 
plug a book or something. Or... Actually, actually, I, I, I my new Netflix special coming out. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I, I have a I have a book chapter coming out on the toolification of peace building. Uh, it's in an edited volume on Syria, actually, and I uh, my chapter has nothing to do with Syria. It has to do with uh, uh, with the toolification of of peace building and specifically how peace building approaches uh, have come to be stripped of their sort of political weight or political content and uh, have become really tools that anybody can pick up with whatever ideology or with whatever agenda they may have and they can use it as conflict sorry as social transformatory uh, tools and how uh, states and and powerful actors have actually appropriated the language and the approaches of peace building uh, uh, in order uh, to to further entrench themselves in power and uh, and that's kind of uh, an article that that's coming out and if i get to if i get to go there i'm really interested in uh, in the political economy of uh, rebel to ruler transformation in in mm. muslim mindanao so that that to me is a really fascinating uh, topic so that's if i manage to to get there then i i would like to do that research sometime next year uh, I look forward to reading both of them, <laughs> Thank you. Thank and we'll you. put the links to them uh, in the description once they come out. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Balash, thank you so much for your time and for talking to, to us. And and um, I have really enjoyed our conversations over the years, and this was this was no exception. It was I really liked hearing your perspective on things and also finding um, resonance of like similar experiences and, and approaches to peace building and and the, the criticisms of it so so that was that was really um meaningful for me yes. thank you thank you uh, i appreciate it and yeah i had a good time and it was always it's always great to see both of you so wonderful well it was a pleasure and um i will looking forward to having you on another episode yeah, yeah. let me know when and then you'll find the topic and we'll talk about it okay perfect <laughs> sounds like a good plan <laughs> thank you very much